my, most of the focus of the talk will be on the research itself, some of the results, uh, some of the techniques. Um, I'm happy to dive deeper on some of the techniques if there's a reason to do so, and then I get brief mention at the end of, of the company. But uh, the real focus here is going to be on the research that, that led to the company. So, um, what I'll say is uh, feel free to jump in with questions. I'd rather just be interactive than, uh, than not. So, what really motivates Ambic is, uh, is power. And um, one of the things that, that's been happening over the past 40 years is that, is that we've moved from a gigahertz or performance dominated uh, industry to a, to a power dominated industry. And that's something that's, that's happened over time as technology has evolved. If we go back to the, the 1960s, you had your mainframe computers, you had one of these devices for every large company out there. And uh, they were large, expensive, and, and as a result, there were very few of them. Uh, every 10 years or so, we've seen we've seen pretty tremendous improvements in technology. Flash forward to today, and everybody's got a handset in their pocket. There's over a billion of these devices sold every single year, and uh, they're pretty darn near pervasive. Now, the, the next step forward is that it's not one device per person, but 10 devices per person. It's, it's a chip embedded in your clothing to monitor your health, or it's, it's a chip in your smart grid, your credit card to keep it secure, or a chip in the wall to monitor energy usage. And uh, the, um, the key there is that when we get to that point, we're talking about tens of billions of devices worldwide. That's really incredible. So looking back over all these previous devices, it was, it was always performance driven. Even the devices like a cell phone, which are not only low power devices, were entirely performance driven. There was uh, it was always hit some minimum power while while meeting some uh, minimum performance. And so uh, even in a handset, you're talking about tens or hundreds of megahertz, or potentially more in terms of operating. Um, the next generation, this ubiquitous computing generation, where we have tens of devices per person, it's going to be entirely about energy. It's about uh, devices that last for years or even decades at a time on a single on a single charge. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is, is that I have trouble enough charging my cell phone and my laptop today. If I have 10 more devices or 100 more devices, there's no way I can, I can possibly keep charging these things constantly. So energy really becomes a key focus. And that's what's really uh, driven our research from the start and what eventually led to the founding of Ambic. So um, what I can tell you is that we're, uh, Ambic as a company, I'll, I'll get into this more later, but Ambic as a company is going to be focused on uh, devices that are really part of this next generation of computing. Uh, smart credit cards, uh, devices, tiny sensors for home building automation, um, some pretty incredible medical devices, one of which I'll touch on later. So there are some really nice opportunities here. What I'd like to do, though, um, before I get into the company, is talk about um, some of the research that led to the founding. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about low voltage operation. This is, the, this is really the, the core research that uh, we started that we, that we uh, started with at, at the University of Michigan and eventually led to the founding. Now, I'll also touch on a lot of the other things that we realized along the way, which uh, really go way beyond low voltage operation. Um, and then I want to talk about two generations of uh, microprocessor research prototypes that we developed in Michigan, um, which were actually nominally uh, meant for a specific medical application that is uh, about a cubic millimeter device that, that's implanted in the eye, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I want to talk just briefly about the formation of the company and the energy and questions there. So the, to minimize energy, there's a whole host of techniques that everybody's using today. Uh, you've, got, you've got energy efficient architecture selection. ARM has, has made a, a company out of essentially selling energy efficient architectures. And so they certainly help solve a lot of that, that problem. Gate sizing, clock gating, switching activity suppression, these are all known techniques, things that are used pretty regularly. Um, in addition to that, one of the big knobs that really hasn't been tweaked very hard is voltage is, is supply voltage, voltage scaling. You can reduce supply voltage or to reduce energy. And, and as, as we all know, it's if we look at uh, energy in the system, you've got active energy and sleep energy or leakage energy. Active energy is, is typically the dominant in many systems, uh, and it's proportional to um, the square of voltage. So we can get some pretty substantial reductions in energy with voltage. And so one of the initial questions we set out to answer was, well, how low can you take voltage and still reliably operate your circuit? So the, there have been a number of studies that have looked at just how low you can take voltage. What we're showing here on the left is uh, measured voltage transfer characteristics uh, at 60 millivolts. So this was, this, we took an inverter, looked at the voltage transfer characteristic of that inverter, and it still showed uh, the, the requisite gain greater than one in order to, to 
operates efficiently as an inverter. Now, admittedly, nobody would ever design a circuit to, to operate down here. That's your on the edge of failure, um, but it proves that operation is, is possible. Everybody says, well, you, you have to be above 2 VT in order to operate, and that's just not true. So the threshold current in a device looks a lot like saturation current. It's just a lot lower in terms of absolute value. Uh, what, what was also shown here, actually, was uh, an SRAM cell um, at 65 volts. So this was a single cell. Again, admittedly, it's, it's one cell and not uh, millions of cells, but uh, one cell and showed a uh, complete butterfly curve. So we saw 65 or 70 millivolt, sorry, uh, SRAM cell demonstrating the hardware. So this kind of gives us a sense of how low voltage can actually go. The real question is, should we operate down here? Is there any value in, in doing that? And so that what we did was we spent a lot of time looking at energy. And um, I will point to Bo wherever wherever he went because he he really originated this research. This was really key research, and he was the first to make this key observation that I'm about to discuss. But um, what happens, as I mentioned earlier, is that and if we look at the energy in a typical circuit, in this case an inverter chain, uh, it goes down quadratically with supply voltage. And that, that's as we expect. Now, the, the important thing to note is that I showed two sources of energy in the previous slide, right? There was, there was active energy and, and leakage energy, and we tend to neglect leakage energy um, but it turns out that when you start looking at leakage energy at lower voltage, it rises. Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive because we know that leakage current decreases at low voltage. But it turns out that if we look at the delay of that same inverter chain, it goes up exponentially at low voltage. So what you get is leakage current is going down approximately linearly, a little bit better than that depending on the technology. But your delay is going up exponentially. So you're, you're leaking less, but you're doing so for a much longer period of time. The net result is that the total energy spent on leakage goes up in order to do a specific uh, set of work. And so if we look at total energy, that blue line there, it actually reaches a minimum at some supply voltage. And this was the key observation that Bo uh, popularized and, and was actually key to driving our initial research. So we spent a lot of our time operating right here in that optimal point. Uh, and what, what I should say too is that is that energy reductions of on the order of 20x are, are uh, very possible there. Um, now there, there are a number of key challenges that we face at low voltage. It's not just it's not easy. Otherwise, everybody would be doing. Um, so the first thing is that the on to off current ratio is dramatically reduced. For one point, if you're operating at a 0.13 micron technology, you're operating at 1.2 volts. You get an on to off current ratio of about 800,000. So that is. Or that, that affects both the robustness as well as the speed of the system. The higher the system, the faster your gates are. Um, so we, we travel down here to 250 millivolts, which is a pretty typical sub-threshold voltage. You're going to end up with an on off current ratio of about 800. So uh, it's very tough to distinguish a 1 from a 0 or, or, a, or an on device from an off device when there's only an 800 to 1 difference. Uh, and that becomes actually much more difficult when we consider that we're exponentially sensitive now to, to supply voltage, threshold voltage fluctuations, as well as uh, some threshold slope and temperature. So just as an example, a shift in, in BT here, if we had a, a 100 millivolt shift in the threshold voltage would result in a 14x change in current. And uh, that leads actually to a dramatic, uh, a, a dramatic change in, in the performance of the device. So that's a, that's a key issue that makes design of SRAM particularly challenging very difficult to make these circuits work if there's a lot of variability like that. In fact, designing an SRAM in an old technology, a 0.13 or 0.18 micron technology, is at low voltage is very similar to designing, designing a high voltage memory at 32 nanometers or 45 nanometers. You're running into a lot of the same variability issues. And so we can actually use a lot of the same techniques, it turns out, to design robustly down there. Um, but we spent a lot of years focused initially on these, prob on these problems and how to solve them. It turns out that in some cases that the solution is just to, we can't go after high performance applications. We just sort of ignore the performance problem. Um, so that, we spent a lot of years focused on, on low voltage operation to get active energy down. And I'll talk about a few chips that we developed there and some of the things that we did. Before I do that though, I want to talk about the importance of sleep power. Because um, we spent a number of years focused on low voltage, but then realized halfway through that actually sleep power is a, is a huge source of uh, power consumption when you're spending 99% of your time in sleep mode. For example, and so um, just as, as an example, uh, consider uh, a little microprocessor, a little sub-threshold microprocessor, low voltage microprocessor that is is in some sort of temperature sensing application. It's measuring temperature on a 
on a, a, a frozen chicken or something like that every every 10 minutes or 15, in this case 10 minutes. Given an activity profile like this, we've got, a, I'm assuming, a really low power microprocessor. This, these were actually based on measurements of a, a chip we had. In active mode, we do 2,000 instructions, spend five milliseconds doing that, and at a, at a power level of 780 nanowatts. And then we go into a sleep mode where we're consuming about 150 nanowatts. Um, this, this mode is actually, this is actually lower than the typical commercial part by a fairly large margin. Uh, as is this, but these were research devices. Um, in that case, you're spending about 4.4 nanojoules in active mode, 92 microjoules in sleep mode. So you can see there's a huge disparity here. You're spending far more energy here. Now, admittedly, I've skewed this such that we're, we're sleeping for 10 minutes, but it turns out that there's a lot of applications just like that. And so one of the challenges for us was, hey, we actually want to, this is some of the apps I'll talk about later, we want to put a little one millimeter square battery next to this thing. And oops, we want to put a little uh, one millimeter square uh, battery next to this thing. And uh, as you might expect, a one millimeter square battery has very little energy available in it. Um, about 18 millijoules per millimeter square. And given this activity profile, we can only hit about a 1.4 day battery life. And in some of the medical applications that we're looking at, that's just that's horrible because you've got to open up the patient every 1.4 days. <laughs> it's not a reasonable solution. Uh, so if we're going to hit five year battery life, you need an average power of 110 picowatts. So these are numbers that people just don't even think about normally. 110 picowatts, that, that's 10 to the negative 12. It's very, very low. And so what we did is we, we built a, a series of processors. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that we built was called the Phoenix processor. And this was a processor built both for low voltage operation as well as extremely deep sleep mode operation. Um, it was operating both at uh, sub and near threshold value, so that means sub-threshold is below the threshold voltage, near is right near the threshold voltage. It was operating specifically at 0.5 volts, and so depending on which device you're using, you it above or below the threshold. Simple 8-bit uh, CPU, something that we designed from the ground up. Um, that was in, in part because that's just, it's easier to, to have our hooks into that as, a, as an academic group and, and make some place of games there, but it also allowed us to uh, make some optimization specifically for sleep mode. Um, I'll talk later about this designing your architecture. It's just a really, I don't know why that's happening. A really bad idea, but um, <laughs> the, uh, we've, we've since gone to ARM, and I'm, I'm very happy about that decision. Uh, but we've got a number of elements in there, a watchdog timer, temperature sensor, a, a power management unit that's controlling the sleep states. Um, and uh, the, the, the real centerpiece, in addition to low voltage, is the sleep strategy. And we've done a number of things. Um, at the circuit level, redesign the memory such that they're, they consume about a thousand times less power than typical off the shelf memory. Um, we've got uh, a compression based architecture that compresses memory, makes its footprint smaller in the sleep mode. Uh, we've got a banks of memory that can be shut down uh, if need be. Uh, and we've got a, a, a timer architecture that, that is pretty unique and, and consumes very, very little power. So. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to dig deeper there. Actually, all this information is publicly available, so I'm happy to forward you the paper. But in the interest of time, I don't want to dive too deep. Uh, this was the die photo of the chip. It was, it was developed in a 0.18 microprocess, a TSMC is 0.18 microprocess, actually. And uh, it just turns out that we did, we did quite a bit of uh, analysis as to which node we should be at. You'd think, well, you really want to be at 65 or 45 or 32 nanometers. It gives you the smallest devices. But, it also gives you the leakiest devices, and that's just that's not something that, uh, that that we like. And so we actually did a pretty in-depth analysis, and it turned out that 0.18 was the place to be. Um, it was only about 100,000 transistors, so this is a pretty small device as compared to your typical off-the-shelf commercial devices. Pretty small memories uh, and a small 8-bit CPU. Uh, and then actually something that was that was kind of unique here is it was exclusively routed using minimum width wires. So all of the uh, all of the, the clock distribution was done. Um, pretty circuitously, uh, even power rails per minute routed on different uh, wire. That gave us a little bit more freedom in, in routing, made our design smaller. And it was something that we can do at low voltage. You don't have huge currents running through these devices, and so there's no need to worry about sizing up the width of these things. How many metal layers? This was a six metal layer process. Is your so ASCII here the, the highest, the lowest speed? S SVT is the, the standard VT in the G TSMC or whatever G process. 
and then the HVT is the thick oxide IO device. That's only two. So this, the, yeah, this was two BT. This was not. Uh, we, we weren't going for extra mass layer two. This was all just the standard normal process. Do you, do you use conversion to do, do your chip, or are you basically just manually? 